Shavuot. Let's talk about Shavuot tonight. I picked that because I thought it would be an appropriate topic uh, for this evening. But first and foremost, I don't ever want to do anything, and you can't pray enough. So let me ask the Father to speak only His words. Is that okay? Father, we thank You so much for Your Word. And once again, we ask that You would bless it. You would anoint it. You would take it, put honey on my lips, and let everything that comes out of my mouth be of You, and let nothing come out of my mouth that is not of You. Encourage Your people. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction, O Abba. Move us into a place where we could receive from You in the spiritual realm behind the slides, behind the words, behind the letters. Show us what is hidden. Open up our hearts and minds to see the things that we cannot see in Yeshua's name. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 15 is where we discover the commandment of Shabbat. It says, And you shall count for yourselves from the day after Shabbat, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Shabbats, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to Yahweh. Now many people begin to count, uh, our Jewish brethren count from the day after the high Sabbath. But not very often in Scripture at all is the word Shabbat used in reference to a high Sabbath. Virtually every single time that that Hebrew word is used, it is referred to as the weekly Sabbath. So the way that I believe that you're supposed to count the counting of the Omer is the first, the first of the Shabbats, meaning that if Passover falls on a Tuesday, you wait till Shabbat and the very next day begins the counting of the Omer. It makes logical sense from the perspective of every single feast day is given on the seventh day, the sixth day of this month, the, the, the tenth day of Tishrei, the first day, fourteenth uh, day of the first month, He's very specific, but this is the only time in all of the feast days that he, he's not specific. He, the only spe specification is 50 days from after the Shabbat. If it was supposed to be the day after the high Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread, it would have been the sixth of Savan every time. He would have just said the sixth day of Savan, but he didn't. He wants us to count. You wouldn't have to count. If you knew the day, you wouldn't have to count. So he wants us to count the Omer. Count what's inside of us. That's what we're doing. We're preparing what's growing inside of us since Pesach. Deuteronomy 16.10, And thou shalt keep the feast of weeks, another word for Shavuot, unto Yahweh your Elohim with a tribute of a free will offering of thy hand, which thou shalt give unto Yahweh your God according to Yahweh your Elohim as he blessed you. We talked about that a little earlier as we did our offering. It's a pilgrimage feast, Deuteronomy 16, 16. Three times in a year shall you males appear before Yahweh, your Elohim, in the place which you shall choose, which he shall choose, in the feast of unleavened bread, and in the feast of weeks, and in the feast of tabernacles. They shall, they shall not appear before me empty-handed. Now see, this is something that, that, this is what we get emails on. And I say, wait a minute. We're supposed to not come before the Lord empty-handed. What? Magi would ever come before a king empty-handed. Not one. Everyone in ancient times knew that if you were to visit the king, you were to bring a gift. It's a gift of appeasement, especially if you were in trouble. And since we've fallen so short in the glory of our king, it makes perfect sense that three times a year we would come before our king in the best way that we can and we would offer him our lives first, and secondly, what our, whatever our offering may be. Some of you have been very creative and very amazing in your offerings. Have you come beforehand and, and you share with me what the Father put on your heart to give? Some of you was coin collections, and some of you tangible items and things that that uh, you you don't want to part with. But the Father said, "Give. This is what I want." For some of you, it was an oath or a promise because you didn't have finances to give. He didn't say if you don't have finances, you can't give. He said bring an offering, the best that you can. It's 50. This is the 50th day. How many of you have been married? Anybody in here been married for over 50 years? Any 50 years in here? No? Okay. We're a young congregation. I know, I see that hand online. Congratulations. 
Here's what the meaning of 50 is. This is pretty significant. It's amazing. The number 50 is revelation. It means freedom. It's attached to the Jubilee year, which I've taught on before. Every 50 years, so you count seven, every six days, one, two, three, four, five, six, Shabbat. It's like a, it's like a weekly Jubilee. And then you count six years, and then the seventh year is a Shemitah year. It's a, it's a time of resting the land. And then you count seven sevens of years, and then the 50th year is the Yovel. It is the year of Jubilee where all of your debts are erased. We think that's a good thing, but that means all of your possessions go back to the original owner as well. It's a, it's a number of power. It's a number of it's chapters in, in Genesis, 50 chapters in Genesis. Do you think that's coincidence? It's the width of Noah's ark in cubits. The earth is 50 times larger than the sun. How interesting is that? That would be pretty incredible if it was 50 times larger than the sun. You couldn't hear this online, but I thought they were booing me. They were saying moon. I'm like, wow, it's a tough crowd. I even threw four slides and they're already booing me. All right. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come. The number 50 is used 77 times in the Bible. And this glass is 50 times larger than the average glass. Like I'm drinking from a like a keg or something. It's just <laughs> giant nephilim. All right. Anyway, this is amazing. Did you know every Hebrew letter has a number attached to it? And so when you get to the letter noon, the noon is a number fifty. The letter noon is the number fifty. Some of you, if you don't know what the letter noon means, I'm going to tell you. It means seed. What you see there on the right is the Paleo-Hebrew, 4,000-year-old script, original pictograph Hebrew. It's a form of a fish or a sperm. It means life, seed, fish. In Aramaic, it means fish. In Hebrew, noon means kingdom and heir to the throne. What did Yeshua say? What did He say? He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the noon. How, remember, how many remember who, who, who's the father of Joshua? Isn't that amazing? Joshua, Yehoshua ben Nun. Yeshua, son of life, is what it means. Continuity, perpetuality, eternality. Noon means life. It's like a plant, that, a seed that's put in the ground that bursts through the seams of the earth and it brings forth life. It brings forth fruit. 50 is the year of breakthrough. For us, this year, in the year 2012, Shavuot 2012, has been a year of incredible breakthrough and you don't even know what's coming next. By the end of the year, this is going to be one of the most incredible years looking back, I believe, for you and for him. He's breaking through the crusty earth with life. Let's talk about some noon words. It's the 14th letter, neen, it means posterity, offspring, or progeny. Neked means progeny or posterity. Nachal means inheritance. Nachar means river. Nata means stretch out. And Naar means youth. Look at the connection here of, of birth, life. How many know what the letter is before noon? Mem. Very good. You guys are wondering. Mem. Mem is a, is a womb. It's, 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 it's the waters of a womb that burst out to life, to noon. So it should make sense 
that, that noon is connected to offspring, progeny, inheritance, a river of waters that come from the previous letter, Mem, that wash out the entire earth like Noah's flood and bring forth life in our youth. Naaman, faithful, Naviah, prophet, Noah, rest, Nacham, comfort, Nafesh is your soul, different than your spirit. By the way, not to go on a quick tangent, but your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. It's your personality. It's your, in Greek, charisma. It is your, is your, your, your charisma. It's your color. It's who you are. It's what makes you who you are. It makes you as strange as who you are. It's your soul. Your spirit is the power plant. It is, the, uh, it is like the battery that Yahweh puts inside of every living nefesh. Remember when Adam was on the ground, he was lying on the ground, he's just dead. What did he do? He breathed the shama into his nefesh and he became a living soul. What was it that it was breath? What was it when he did CPR? What, what was that? He breathed his ruach, his wind into his lungs and gave him life. This is why when a man dies, his soul, his mind, will, and emotions, who he is, his, 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 uh, uh, his personality, goes into Sheol and awaits judgment. It waits the resurrection of the dead, the first and the second, whether you are wicked or whether you are just. But your spirit goes back to God from which it came. That's where we get confused. That's where our, for, our former... Uh, uh, forefathers got confused because it says uh, your spirit goes back to God from which it came, so everyone when they die must go to heaven. No. No one stands before the throne until judgment day. Otherwise, what would judgment day be for? There's a resurrection. 2 Kings 2.16, just to go through a couple 50s and show you something pretty amazing. Then they said to him, look now, there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, Elijah lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And Elisha said, you shall send anyone. You shall not send anyone. Now think about this. Elijah is like, Elijah, I think he can take care of himself. And they say, oh, he's probably gone. And this, remember, the Spirit of the Lord just uh, you know, caught him up and threw him down on some mountain. I think that would be okay too. But the people didn't think so. And so 50, by the way, just so you know, when 50 men are sent, that's military. That's a military term. That is a, a, a I can't remember the exact term of it, but it's like a, a legion of men, okay? It's a company. It's 50. They always went in 50. So when you see that in your Bibles, know that you're talking about not 50 men, you're talking about 50 military men. How many know that earthly military can't protect you? One man of God can wipe out an entire legion with just one simple prayer. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, send them, fine. Therefore, and they sent 50 men and they searched for three days. Three days. I find that interesting. And they searched for three days, but not, they did not find him. So 50 men went out the first time. 50 men went out the second time. And 50 men went out the third day. Three days, 50 men, and they didn't find anything. And when they came back, for they had said in Jericho, he said to them, did I not say, don't go? Talking about like the two most powerful prophets that ever lived. Then the men of the city said to Elisha, please notice the situation of the city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground is barren. And he said, bring me a new bowl. And he put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Watch what happens. The covenant of salt is getting ready to begin. Then they went out to the source of the water. Where did they go? To the, where did they go? To the spring, the source of the water. And they cast in the salt there and said, Thus says Yahweh, I have healed this water, for it shall be no more death or barrenness. Prophetically, what's happening is the people, they don't have bread because they don't have pure water. In the scriptures, the, the word of God is referred to as, as bread, is it not? So what happens, what, what does the water represent in scripture? It represents the spirit of Elohim. Remember, the spirit in creation hovered over the face of the waters. 
If you don't have the right spirit, if you do not have the fruits of the spirit working in your life, then your bread cannot rise. There, there can be no bread. Your bread will be stale or will be uneatable. So they were in need of fixing the spirit, the river. It's all about, we sang the song about the river of life. Without the river of life, you cannot have gladness. Some of you, have, you don't have gladness. Somebody came up to me last night and said, man, I just, I just need joy. We get in the river. Well, what does that mean? It means change your attitude. Did you know that, that when you have depression, as I mentioned earlier in a few other teachings earlier, it's not depression. It's a spirit of depression. Tell it to go away and get in the river. In reality, it's like standing before the River Jordan and, and, and wanting to be immersed by John. And going, man, I just, I'm so depressed because I want to be in the river. I just want to be in the river. I just want to be immersed. Father, please help me be immersed. That's Greek. That's what we do. Father, we stand before the river and say, Father, I'm thirsty. Please send me water. Please. And then we go further than that. We call people to fast and pray for the Father to send us water. But the reality is the water is right in front of you. It's a facade. And I told this young lady, as she was halfway through, I just stopped her and started rebuking the spirits. To get off of her. You're not going to lie to her. You spirit of, of depression and anxiety. She's a child of the king. Hasatan, move out of the way. She immediately jumped in there and started dancing. It's that simple. We make things so difficult to serve our king. Just do it. And you will not have be bare. You have no barrenness anymore. How many remember the Elijah and the 50 men in 2 Kings chapter 1? If you have your Bibles turned there, I'm going to take a moment to read this because this is pretty amazing. 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 1 and following. It says, It's now Moab rebelled against Israel after the death of Ahab. And, Ahaz, and Ahaz, excuse me, Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber, which was in Samaria, and became ill. So he sent messengers and said to him, Go inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I will recover from this sickness. But the Malachim of Yahweh said, Elijah said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise and go up and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria and say to them, It is because there is no god in Israel that you are going to inquire of Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron? It's a Philistine, a god. When the messengers returned to him, he said to them, Why have you returned? They said to him, A man came up to meet us and said, Go return to the king who sent you and say to him, Thus says Yahweh, it is, because there is, no, is it because there is no God in Israel that you are sending and choir of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron? Therefore you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you will surely die. He said to them, What kind of man was he who came up to meet you and spoke these words to you? They answered and said, he was a hairy man with a leather girdle about, about his loins. And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Then the king said to him, sent to him a captain of 50 with his 50. So how many is that? How many people is that? A captain with 50 men. There we go. You're making your kids nervous. So then the king sent a captain of 50 with his 50, and he went up with him, and behold, he was sitting on top of the hill. And he said to him, O man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah replied to the captain of 50, if I'm a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then fire came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. I guess they didn't have anything to say about that. So he again sent him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he said to him, O man of God, thus says the king, come down quickly. Elijah replied, make me. If I'm a man of God, let the fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50. Then the Esh of Elohim came down from heaven and consumed the 50 and the captain. So the king, of course, kings don't learn from their past mistakes, and it's not him going out there, so he sends another 50 and another captain. 
By this time, the captain is starting to get a clue. The previous 102 came back crispy. So when the third captain of 50 went up, came, he bowed down on his knees before Elijah. Smart guy. Begged him and said, oh man of God, please let my life and the lives of these 50 servants of yours be precious in your sight. Forget about what the king sent me for. I don't want to die. Behold, fire came down from heaven and consumed the first two captains of 50 with their 50s, but now let my life be precious in your sight. And the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him, do not be afraid of him. So he arose and went down with him to the king. Then he said to him, thus says Yahweh, because you have sent messengers to inquire of Beelzebub, the God of Ekron, it is, because, is it because there's no God in Israel to inquire of his word? Therefore, you shall not come down from the bed where you have gone up, but you shall surely die. So you have this story, and it goes on, and the king definitely did die. What do we learn from the story? Never mess with a prophet. Now, let me ask you a question. Did the 50 know he was a prophet? Did they believe it? No. You see, it's not for you to decide who a prophet is. Because prophets is a do-or-die situation. If they are a prophet from Yahweh, you will see fruit or fire. If they're not a prophet, the Bible says you have nothing to fear. They can do you no harm, and they cannot bless you. You're to judge them by their fruits, and the other prophets are supposed to judge the words of the prophets. So let's talk through this now. How many went out in the first group? 51. How many went out in the second group? How many went out in the third group? How many is that? 153. How interesting is that? So 2 Kings 1.9 says, Then the king sent to him a captain of 50 with the 51. That's 51, 51, and 51. That's 153. We turn to John chapter 21, verse 11. It says, Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153, came before the king, Yeshua. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Yeshua then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Yeshua showed himself. Think there's a connection? Everything that your, your king says is there for a reason. He just doesn't tell Bible stories like we tell our children. It's all for a reason. How about some interesting facts about the number 153? The length of the gra grand gallery inside the Great Pyramid is 153 feet. Did you know that? Within the great period, from the king's chamber floor up to the summit platform, there are 153 courses of masonry. By coincidence, not at all. Study the number 153, you find out that it is one of the most powerful numbers in all numbers. It's a pyramid number. It's a tri what they call a triangular number. I'll let you study it on your own. It's fascinating. It's almost as if Yahweh knew something about the number 153. It's a very, very spiritual number. It points to something, to our king. We move to Acts chapter 2. What do we find? We've been talking about it all weekend. When the day of Shavuot was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came down a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like a fire, the sheen, the letter sheen, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What do we learn about Shavuot? Shavuot is the giving of the Torah. Let's make a connection to Acts chapter 2. 1,200 years before that, the Holy Torah was given on Mount Sinai. It's the truth. We call it the Old Covenant. Then you have 1,200 years later, one for each tribe of Israel, the giving of the Spirit. We call that the New Covenant. A day when the first people denied their calling as priests in the Old Covenant. Remember, that's how the Levites got chosen. They denied the fact that they were all supposed to be a kingdom of priests. And he chose the firstborn of Israel. He chose the Levites, the Levitical, what we call the Levitical priesthood now. It was one of the original 12 tribes. And a day, 1,200 years later, when his people accepted their calling as priests. You see, the first time he wanted his people to be priests. There was not supposed to be a mediator. He wanted to send his Ruach, but he chose, they chose not to. They rejected their priesthood. 
And so they rejected the Ruach. 1,200 years later, Yahweh's people in the upper room, the Holy Spirit came down on Mount Sinai again, quote unquote. They accepted their calling as priests, and that's why we are a kingdom of priests. Revelation 20, verse 6 is, Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. That's when the Messiah comes, by the way. On such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of, of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. 2 Peter 2 9 says, but, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God. How many know he's quoting, I believe, Hosea? If I remember right, it's Hosea chapter 2. Who is he talking about? The northern kingdom of Israel, the ten tribes. Where he says, in that moment, right now, I'm calling you not my people. But in the very place that I call you not my people, you will be my people. What's he doing? He's calling the northern and the southern kingdom together. You are a chosen people. So this is when it's going to get interesting. The Torah, listen, leads to legalism without the Spirit. And the Spirit leads to emotionalism without the Torah. Let me say that again. The, the Torah leads to legalism. If you do not have the Ruach living inside of you, you will make up more rules to support the other rules, to support the other rules, and you will create fence after fence after fence until it becomes just like the first century where nobody even knows what the Torah is. I have Jewish friends, and uh, one of them is very, very uh, eloquent in the Scriptures, studied the Torah, this close from being a rabbi, and he says, the law says this. And I said, no, it doesn't. He said, yes, it does. I said, no, it doesn't. It was like a northern kingdom and southern kingdom. It was like, no, it doesn't. Yes, it does. No, it doesn't. Yes, it does. Just like two brothers would argue. And I said, no, that's the oral law, sir. You're, you're quoting from the Mishnah. Your rabbis say that. But the Holy Torah does not say that. And he laughed. And when he laughed, I said, I caught you. Because he knows there is a difference. But in Judaism, they, they really look at it as all the same. It's the law of God. When the rabbis say it, it's the law. Where do you think Catholicism got it from, by the way? Where do you think the Pope got it from? Do you think they were just stroke of genius? It was from the rabbis. The rabbis have the concept out of Isaiah that whatever he puts in, in their lips is the word of God. And they believe, just like the Catholics do, that when the rabbis speak, that they actually can trump the Creator. Now, they don't look at it that way, so let me give them some credit, but that is what they're saying. And that's where uh, the Catholic religion, the Pope, gets the same concept. They didn't make it up. They looked at, I mean, if you look at a lot of the ordinances in Catholicism, they're right out of, out of first century Judaism. And some of them are very deep, and I will give them credit. At least they have some structure and they understand history. Their application might be a little bit different, maybe not a, a little bit biblical. But something that we need to look into is some of the structure that they do is pretty amazing. It has phenomenal roots. Some not so good, some good. I'm not here to pick on any particular denomination or group of people because every group of people has an element of truth. So the Torah leads to legalism without the Spirit, and the Spirit leads to emotionalism without the Torah. I'm going to suggest that on one side, the southern kingdom has the Torah without the Spirit. It's led to legalism in many areas. And in Christianity, we have the Spirit without the Torah, and it's led to unbelievable emotionalism, which is why some of you are scared to death when someone, you know, you come into a, 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 a healing moment when people are being healed or delivered of an unclean spirit, or God forbid that somebody speak in a foreign language. Because you've been so attached to emotionalism, you don't want to go there. So watch this. You know what this is? This is the human brain. As I sat and I meditated, on oh, Father, what do you want me to teach? What do, you want me to, what do you want me to show people? I have hardly any time to prepare for all the things that you're doing in my life. It's going to have to be supernatural revelation. Instantly, I had a vision of the brain. And so I said, okay, that's nice. I know nothing about the brain. 
Can you be a little bit more specific? No kidding, this is my conversation with the Father. He tolerates me. So he showed me the brain. And I literally prayed and I said, Father, okay, I, I, what is it? What, sh- you're going to have to help me out here. So before I kind of go to the punchline on what he shared with me, let me share with you something I've shared before, but make this an unbelievably relevant because I think this is going to bless you. If it's from the Lord, it'll bless you. Your brain is made up of two hemispheres. Go figure. You have two arms, two eyes, two ears. Some of you have two mouths. Not supposed to be that way. You're only supposed to speak the truth. But if you take a look at the brain, it's completely separate. 100% separate from one another, and it's connected at the very bottom so that they can speak to each other. It's like a a cord that is connecting one half to the other half. On the left side of your brain, that is your your, uh, analytic thought. It is your compartmentalization. Uh, It is many of you that are firstborns, you are left brain people. You think in compartments. You think uh, analytically. You think from bullet point to bullet point. They're good at math, typically. CPAs tend to be an engineer. It's very left brain. Tell a joke inside of an engineer, and they will try to break it down and figure out why it's funny. And then they will tell you that's not funny. Those are your left brain people. The right brain people, on the other hand, are very creative. They're very out of the box. They're connected with their emotion. They sense things that are happening around them. That left brain people go, I don't, I don't see anything. I don't sense anything, but I'm hungry. Some of you, this is daily in your marriage, and you know it. Okay. Yeah. The right brain people tend to be the ones that are artists. They have a free spirit. From my perspective as a parent, I always know it when I have a right brain child because they'll run into walls while singing. (laughs) Twice in one night. No concept of what's around them. They don't care. One time, my right brain daughter, I had an ironing board down. She comes into my closet. She sees the ironing board. Okay? She runs into the ironing board. Knocks her in the head. She falls down on the ground. The first she thinks she says, I'm okay, Dad. I said, how? How is that possible? You were looking at the irony board. How do you run into it? Because there's no concept of walls. There's no boundaries for right brain people. So here's a great visual. The left brain people are all cubicle people. They have no problem sitting all day long behind a computer in a cubicle. They are happy. They have their space. On the right side, they don't even know how to spell cubicle. They're running around in fields. They're flying kites. They're, they're, they get so free, they're willing to just jump off the edge and go, somebody will save me. They're the kind of people that can leave home with $4 in their back pocket and go, I know, I know I will be okay. And the left brain father says, where are you going to sleep? What are you going to eat? I don't know. I'll find someone. I'll sleep on their couch, under a bridge. They don't care. Life is not about things to them. Life is not about compartments. It's not about understanding details. They don't care about details. If a right brain person plans a vacation, it looks something like this. We're going to go to Hawaii. How are we going to get there? It doesn't matter, but we're going there. What are we going to do? It doesn't matter. We're going to be on a beach. What are we going to do on the beach? Bake. We don't need to know details. They just figure it out as they go. They're like a a wave of the sea, a kite in the air. When a right brain person marries a left brain person, There are issues. Because the left brain person says, this is the way that it's supposed to go. The right brain person says, get out of my way. I don't want boundaries. You're restricting me. 
But what's amazing is the left brain and the right brain are designed to work in tandem. They're connected. They are the Holy Torah, connected by the ring that binds them, the lambskin of His Word. I'm excited to share this with you because this really revolutionized a concept in me. So I want you to look at this very carefully because this was the part in my, in my prayer that I said, Father, what does this mean? Okay, I understand. Left brain, right brain. What are you trying to share? And he, and he showed me this. It was instantaneous that he showed me the picture of the Ten Commandments. And I said, oh, no, no, for real? I already knew where he was going. So I'm flipping through the pages of my electronic Bible. So let's go through them. Because some of you, this is, thought is going to revolutionize your life. Is it possible that the Ten Commandments are broken down into two cranial hemispheres trying to teach us a lesson of how to communicate with Him and with our neighbor? Number one, thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Is there any emotion involved in that whatsoever? It's a static commandment. So, which side of the brain does it fit on? The left side. It's compartmentalized. We, there's no emotion attached. We just do. Number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. It's a commandment. It's black and white. No emotion, no color. So which side of the brain should we attach it to? The left. Number three, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord God in vain. Let me interpret that the way that was originally written in Hebrew. You should not make a promise in the name of Yahweh and break it. That's what it really means. Static or color? Black and white. It's just a commandment. There's, there's, no, there's no emotion involved. Just don't make any, 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 don't take my name in vain. Don't make any oaths. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It goes on and spends quite a bit of time inside the Ten Commandments explaining that. But remember the Sabbath. It's a commandment. It's black and white. It's static. It, it's just do this. Stop at a red light. No emotion. Number five, honor your father and your mother. This takes no emotion because this is just flat out whether you like it or not. This is what we have to do. It doesn't matter whether your mother and father are worthy of honor. Respect is earned. Honor is not. Whole message can be given on that. Parents, don't write me or email, but you do not deserve respect. Respect is earned. Honor is automatic. I honor the President of the United States of America. His position holds that honor. Do I respect him for the way that he acts? Absolutely not. But I absolutely honor the position that Yahweh has given him and the authority he has over me. There is a big difference. Static, black and white, thus fulfilling the left side of the brain. So now we move to the second hemisphere and we amazingly find five commandments that are nothing but emotion. Thou shalt not kill, you're dealing with an emotion. Thou shalt not commit adultery, you're dealing with clearly an emotion. Thou shalt not steal, you're dealing with an emotion. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. And thou shalt not covet your neighbor's things, your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife. It's all about an emotion. And so what we have, ladies and gentlemen, is we have literally the Ten Commandments broken down like a brain trying to tell us how to relate to one another and how to relate to the Creator that most of us have shut down the left-hand side of the brain. Most of Christianity has shut down the left-hand side of the commandments. We don't need any, any you know, the, the black and white, the static. We want to be free. We want to consume ourselves in what we want to do. We want to be filled with emotion. We want the Spirit of God to just rest upon us and guide us and lead us. But He doesn't guide us and lead us without the static compartments called the instructions. And so what happens is, is that religion or Christianity as a whole, if they believe that Yahweh has been, is done away with the commandments, they will find themselves absorbed in the we, in the, excuse me, absorbed in the me, where it's all about myself and it's all about how I relate to one another and you're okay and I'm okay because life is just nothing but emotions. We're turning into a right brain society. And if you turn yourself into a right brain person without any balance of the left side, you, you seriously will walk in the path of Sodom and Gomorrah where truth is relevant and whatever you want to do is, is the most important. 
because you are your own God. Right brain people will eventually become, walk in idolatry without the left brain. The left brain people, on the other hand, they're very strict. This is the way that it needs to be. This is the way that it needs to be. And they may be right, but without the right brain, connecting with the emotion, connecting with the spirit, they will turn into idolatry. Worshiping their cubicle. This is what it looks like. You know, someone sent me an email last week, and I want to say whoever it was to thank you for that. But they sent me an email because this last week the Father showed me this when I was in counseling. I was sharing with uh, uh, a young man who, who's going through some transitions in his life and unbelievably right brain person. Everything is, is, you know, if you give any kind of rebuke or correct, correction to anyone, right brain people go, oh, no, don't do that. You're being mean. Because it's all about the hug. And so this person was all about the hug and got himself into some trouble because he refused to be corrected by the other side, by the left brain. So what is the father doing? It's amazing as this revelation came. The father has him doing left brain things. His career has flipped on its head from going 100% right brain to 100% left brain. And what is the Father doing? This is where the crux of this message is coming from on Shavuot. You want the Holy Spirit to come down. His only job, what He desires and mission to do is to balance you out. Because you cannot be fully automated until you are fully balanced in the Ruach with both the truth and the Spirit. That's what He's looking for, worshipers. So this person is being fully automated into left brain activities in his, in his work right now. Do you know what that's doing? It's stretching and he's, his brain on a scientific level, he's creating synapses. He's cre- it's, br- left brain is beginning to fire more. So you know what he's starting to think? He's starting to think in compartments in certain areas of his brain and he's starting to recognize the value of structure the value of authority, the value of doing things with boundaries and formulas. This gentleman, as he becomes balanced, will be very powerful in the, in the arms and the hands of Yahweh because he will be firing on both sides. Yeshua knew when to, to judge and he knew when to have mercy. He was using, I believe, all of our brains. We're not even using 2%. For you as a believer, my encouragement is this. Some of you know that your left brain, some of you know that your right brain, it's real easy, they're compartmentalized and categorized. They're very easy to to create the dichotomy and figure out which category that you're in. Most of you that are left brain married a right brain. It's there for a reason. Opposites attract because he created it that way. He wants you to listen to the other side of the brain. Because his desire for you is to be whole, whole brain. He wants you to walk in balance. He wants you to know, he wants you to know when to take a step with the right foot and when to take a step with the left foot. Know when to correct and know when to encourage. Know when to say something, know when to be quiet. Know when to pray, know when to run, and so on and so forth. I don't know, this message is a strange message for me, but this is the message that Yah Abba gave me. Because I'm going to bet that most of us have never, ever prayed this prayer that I'm going to ask you to pray that I believe will begin to change your life. You won't see this for some time. But say, Father, strengthen the other side of my brain. Abba says that He changes our spirituality through our physical, and He changes our physical through the spiritual. You've heard me say it a million times. So I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is from Yahweh. It was a vision, and it's a message that's very simple. If you want to be fully used into the Father's hand, you must be able to see what you cannot see. And that will only come when you have balance in your life. So if you are off the charts, right brain, the Father says, do something that's left brain. Do something that's, that's compartmentalized, that works on the analytical part. Study math. Oh, that would be torture. Put together an engine. Learn something. If you are left brain, Go buy a kite and go fly it. (laughs) 
Because that's what your spouse tells you to do all the time anyway. So just listen to the other side of your brain. Do something fun. Most women are right brain, very creative people. What do they do? They're waiting for their spouse to be just, just off the cuff, just wake up one morning to go, honey, let's go to the park and let's do a picnic and fly a kite. They're never going to think that. First, they will go to their office and they will draw it up an Excel spreadsheet. They'll do research on restaurants, five-star rating. Never would they go, let's go to that one. Stretch yourselves. Take this as a serious message. The Father is doing something in His church today. He's doing something in His people around the world. He is growing our left side of the brain. For those that have grown up in evangelical Christianity your whole life, we have been right brain people. Emotionally connected with one another as one big unit, a hug. What the Father is doing is He wants to take the hug and He wants to put boundaries and limits and, and He wants us to understand why we're hugging. And when it's good to hug and when it's not good to hug, so on and so forth. He's bringing His Holy Torah up. He's strengthening the left side of the brain. So what you have in the Hebrew Roots movement over the last 50 years is we, we shut down and severed the spinal column and got rid of the right-hand side of the brain. And we've taken the left-hand side of the brain. We said, oh, we need the law. As if the law can save you. So what has it done over the last 50 years? It's produced nothing but legalism. And all, most of Christianity's right brain. So the right brain looks at this new left brain entity and says, I don't want anything to do with that. That's crazy. There's no life there. But imagine what could happen. It is happening. Where we take the left-hand side of the brain, should I say the left-hand side of the book, and connect it to the right hemisphere of the book, tear out the middle page that says New Testament, and make the whole brain work. The left brain people say we have to have it all figured out. The right brain people say we don't have to know anything figured out. They're right! Left brain people, let's take the word of Yahweh because this is what he's doing. He wants us to take his holy Torah, which is, which is restrictions of your flesh. You should be happy about that. It's boundaries. It's like a huge farm with a fence around it. The right brain, the left brain wants to figure out how to navigate through all of these things. The right brain wants to just go out and party. If we could just do this, and this is the heart my heart, and I believe it's the heart of the Father, is to take the freedom that we have in the right-hand side of the book of the Ruach HaKadosh and take the geometry of the left-hand side of the book. A kite is made out of geometry. It's made from math. But it's nothing without the Spirit. If we could take the kite and take the Spirit and put them together, we will soar. And so can I say this to you for your prayer? As this movement, as this Yeshua movement begins to take over this world and get a larger voice, it will only happen when the Spirit, the, the right side, meets the left side. So pray for Yahweh's people to be strengthened in the area that they are weak. This message will change your marriage overnight. If you don't value the other side of your brain, you are brain dead. If you cut that severing cord thinking, oh, I don't need the other side, it's already mostly separated anyway. You will have death value when people come to you and they say, this is what I see in your life. That means that you can't see something. Take it serious. Somebody needs to hear this message. The Father is sending you people to speak life to you and you think it's death. I want you to consider that you are rejecting Yahweh's voice at every turn.
If someone comes to you and says, I think you have egg on your face, you should probably listen because you can't see your forehead. This is where a body comes into, into play. Father, we come before you and we thank you for our spouse. Take the hand of your spouse if you have one tonight. We thank you, Father, that you have given us a left brain and a right brain. We thank you, Father, that you've given us one another to keep one another accountable and holy. Father, would you forgive us? Worship team, can you come on up, please? Father, would you forgive us for our arrogance and our stubborn rebellion and pride that we have rejected and devalued the other side of the coin. Father, it is my prayer that as this Yeshua movement begins to move forward and we present to the world the Hebrew Yeshua instead of a Greek Jesus, as we truly try to represent the whole book, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Would you make sure that you infuse us with enough of your Ruach, because if your Ruach doesn't come, this kite doesn't get off the ground. We can hold it and pick it up and run with it all we want, but if you do not infuse this movement with your spirit, it is dead before it begins. So Father, it is my prayer tonight not on this holy day of Shavuot. You came down 2,000 years ago. I'm asking you to rise up inside of us. Make us alive. Teach us what it means to follow you and your commandments. We don't have to know how to do it. We just need to start trying. Break us of our pride. Break us of our anger. Break us of our lack of faith in miracles. And let us live as one people with one God under one name and in one land. Would you stand with me tonight, please?